Okay, we are live. All right, thank you. Um, good morning again. Uh, I would like to call to order the CMP P and I committee meeting. Um, for the first item on the agenda, can I please get a motion and a second to adopt the minutes from our November thirtieth meeting? So moved, Madam Chair. Thank you. A second. I'll second. Thank you. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Okay. Um, next up, we're going to go to Stacy. Uh, this is uh, back to this uh, MOA uh, between the Commission and Atlantic County. Uh, for the Atlantic County Park at Lake Lenape. Stacy. Good morning. I'm just waiting for my PowerPoint to come up. Um, and can you put your mic on, Stacy? I have it on, actually. Oh, it is? All right. Oops, I had trouble. I'll try to bring it closer to me. Oh, that's better already. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Screen sharing now. <laughs> So on your screen, you should be seeing the relevant portion of Lake Lenape Park, um, which is the western shoreline. And that is just to orient everyone. Um, this is Black Horse Pike. This is um, Route 40 down here is Harding Highway. This is Makepeace Lake, um, which is also a wildlife management area. So. As you know, this memorandum of agreement um, is intended to amend the 1998 MOA with Atlanta County, which authorized certain construction within Lake Lenape on the Western shore um, that was not completely consistent with the requirements of the CMP. So in particular, at that time, they were installing um, sewer, uh, which is not permitted in the forest area, which is what this is. And they were also um, going to be building the boathouse, which you see here, the dock structure, the boat ramp, um, and also uh, they were authorized to do construction of camping facilities. Um, and that's all relevant because at the time when they did the 98 MOA, they were required to deed restrict 1,822 acres of the park. Which and, and they went ahead and did that, but in doing the deed of conservation restriction, they incorporated the terms of the MOA, and the uh, terms of the MOA had very um, specific provisions with regard to the dimensions and construction of this L-shaped dock adjacent to the boat ramp. And in order to um, through time in order to address what has now become a safety concern at the park. The uh, county came to the commission to ask to amend the MOA to remove the requirement for the specific dimensions of the stock. And um, I'm just going to quickly point out to you, this area here is the parking area. The safety concerns were as a result of everything funnels, as you can see, down into this dock area and into the boat ramp. And so what's happening is you've got students with skulls trying to come onto the dock. You've got trucks backing up with their boat trailers onto the boat ramp, and it's causing a safety concern. Um, they've got multiple users in this area all being funnels to utilize the dock and the lake right here. Um, and that's causing conflicts, which quite frankly, during the public hearing on January 4th, the county admitted at the time that they did the MOA, nobody really thought about what the potential conflicts would be. And so over time, and not surprising, I mean, 98 was quite a while ago. Over time, they realized that putting the specifics as to um, the dock structure itself in the presents a problem for them. So what they are proposing is they are going to build new docks. They also told us at the public hearing that the dock system that's currently there is aging out. 
and would need to be replaced. And that's what, another reason why um, they came to the commission at this point in time. So the existing boat ramp would stay. They would build another dock adjacent to the boat ramp. There's going to be a canoe launch. And then far away from the boat ramp, they were going to put in a longer dock for the students for scholarly purposes. Um, that was their initial proposal. However, in speaking with the county um, staff, suggested that rather than, again, have a very specific proposal with regards to the docks, it would make more sense to create, we're call, I call it a development pocket. That's actually not what I would call it um, now. But there's the existing boathouse. Here's the existing dock. And we would create a 200 by 300 rectangular area. Um, block 857, I believe. Lot 55 is the lake itself. And um, the deed restriction then, would they would have to go to DEP and have the deed restriction altered to make it clear that anywhere within this box, they would be permitted to put floating docks. So they would have the ability going forward to redesign the docks within that envelope to meet the concerns both for their users and also for safety. However, as I mentioned in the beginning, the 1998 MOA was an offset, was an MOA that required or allowed deviations, which required an offset. So if we take out this portion of the currently deed restricted area, the staff requested that they provide an, a replacement offset. Um, I'm going to go back to that in a moment. So here is the area of the lake. And then up here is the area of the offset. And this is a, I, I took a, uh, I went into Google Maps and found a close up shot. So this is the camping area. This is the area that they're proposing for the offset. And as you can see, it's far, it, it's in its natural pristine state. It's not really developed. Um, and, and going back, they would be giving up, they currently have under the 98 MOA, the ability to build another L-shaped dock in this area. They would be abandoning that approval. Um, it would be another 200 by 300 foot box. And that area would be deed restricted so that there would be no docks, no development. Um, and in terms of the value of the offset in comparison to the boathouse area, which has been developed and where they do need flexibility in order to accommodate the public that utilizes the park. This area, according to the county, makes a lot more sense and, and staff agrees in terms of having this be the replacement offset. So I'm here today, we've provided the executive director's report in which uh, staff recommended that the commission approve the MOA amendment. And I'm here today to ask that the committee um, refer the matter to the full commission. We've provided the executive director's report. We've provided also a draft resolution. So if you have any questions on those documents that were provided to you, I'm happy to provide to answer any questions or make any changes. Um, there was a public hearing, as I mentioned, on the 4th of January. Only the county showed up. So we had two representatives of the county who provided testimony. Um, there has been no other comments submitted on this amendment. Okay, thank you. Any commissioners have any questions uh, or comments on this? Okay. Um, Mark, here, you're. Uh, Mark, I'm sorry, I was oh, muted. Mark, you're muted. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, I, I just wanted to make the comment, Madam Chair, that I've been really uh, pleased and, and, and wanted to say so at the way the county has worked very closely with our staff over the years in uh, trying to make sure that this uh, project uh, addresses their needs. And uh, I've just been very grateful to them for the uh, the way that they, they have uh, done this and, and worked very collaboratively with the staff. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, any other commissioners questions or comments? We need a motion to refer this to the full commission. Yes. Yes. I would move to the full commission. I'll second it. Okay. Excellent. All in favor? Say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? All right. 
Thank you. And thank you, Stacy, and again, the staff for this work. I know this has been yet another labor of love, so thank you. Um, okay, moving along, I think next up we're going to go to Ed um, for uh, an update on this uh, system, treatment systems pilot program. Okay, very good. Good morning, commissioners. Uh, so I'm going to run through some slides very quickly. Um, I believe that this PowerPoint presentation is intended to supplement a report that went out, went out in your packets on the pilot program. Um, so uh, there we go. Uh, so it's, this is an update. Great. Yeah, I must have bring this through the end of last year. So the numbers that we're going to present in this report uh, are current through December 30th of 2022. Uh, so the first thing that I think we need to acknowledge is that the pilot program came about as a result of an ad hoc committee that was formed back in 2000. Um, did tremendous work to identify a way in which the commission could um, find advanced treatment systems that would allow development on parcels less than 3.2 acres. Our pilot septic dilution model says you need 3.2 acres to build on a conventional septic system. So this was an effort undertaken uh, by a uh, collaboration between many finance commissioners, the state commissioners whose names are all represented there. The finance municipal council participated, the finance preservation alliance participated, and the New Jersey Builders Association participated. And the one thing that I really like to mention about this collaboration is that there was a unanimous decision across all of these various entities to authorize the implementation of the pilot program. So it was widely supported by the commissioners and those members of those other organizations. It was formed in August, the pilot program was formed in August, on August 21 of 20, August 21 of 2001. So the, let's see. Oh, can you advance this for me? There we go. So the pilot program, as I mentioned, um, was intended to identify ways in which we could accommodate development where such development is otherwise authorized in the CMP and allow that residential development to meet very, very rigorous ecologically based standards for nitrogen uh, attenuation. And you know, I highlight that where such development is otherwise authorized, because every time we ever talked about this pilot program, Andy Eshman would always remind us all that this did not allow for new development. This was to allow for development that the plan had already authorized. Um, and the program back in 2001, 2002 attracted tremendous interest from around the country. Um, all of these regions, that like the Pinelands are ecologically sensitive or interested in ways in which they too could accommodate development. And so commission staff was invited to speak about the pilot program uh, all across the country, quite frankly, uh, regional, local, state uh, conferences. We spoke at the uh, Environmental Health Association conference in Atlantic City and had international guests that accompanied us to go look at some of these pilot program systems. So uh, the program has garnered significant attention from around the country. It's still not working. Not working. I got it. Okay, thank you. Just let me know when you want to advance. Sure. I don't know what's happening. So the original program launched in uh, 2002 consisted of five technologies that were identified by a professional engineering consultant that the commission hires. Um, and that consultant identified those five, recommended that because they were not proven in the field that we um, implement the pilot program so that we can test them under real world conditions here in the finance. Um, so that's what we started out with. Now, you know, it was a goal of ours to increase the number of technologies that were available to residents in the pine lands because as time progressed, more and more of these proprietary technologies were coming online. And so we opened up the pilot program to an additional round of technologies in 2011. And there's a list there of those that joined the program in 2011. And then we just did it again in 2021. 
uh, where we've had additional technologies come into the pilot program. Some have uh, what we've identified or, or termed graduated from the pilot program on the basis of satisfactory nitrogen removal. Others were removed from the pilot program for failure to sell systems or actively participate in the program. And others were removed because of their inability to meet our rigorous standard. Um, and I would note that even technologies that are approved by uh, NSF, National Sanitation Foundation, essentially like equivalent to um, a United Laboratory certification, we found that even technologies that were approved by that third party didn't always meet the standards that were required of them. Again, under real world operating conditions. So it really, to me, proves the value of a pilot program and not simply relying on a third party uh, to certify the effectiveness of these systems. And you can see that bottom bar chart there identifies uh, the systems that were installed from 2004 to 2000 and uh, should be 22. Yeah. And um, you can see that, uh, you know, we've had our ups and downs those last couple of years. We've experienced, as we all know, a boom in the residential building market. And we also had a couple subdivisions in the Pinelands, 49 acre lot, uh, 49 lot type subdivisions that required these advanced systems. So we had a flurry of them installed over the last couple of years. Next slide, please. And then we track the installation by finance management area. And you can see that the majority of the systems were installed in the regional growth area in Pinelands Village is kind of what we would expect. Uh, but we also have them throughout the management areas. Um, and those percentages are represented there. Next one. And the system costs have been tracked. Um, you know, we see that the system costs range between, let me say, twenty-five and thirty thousand dollars. That's pretty much the total cost of the system. They are relatively expensive compared to conventional septic system technology, which would be probably up today on the order of fifteen thousand dollars. But there's Two significant benefits that come about as well, many three come about uh, as a result of using these systems. One is that you get to build on a lot that's one acre as opposed to three acres, so the land cost is less. Uh, the other is that because these systems remove uh, not only nitrogen, but also what we call BOD. BOD is the, is the material in wastewater that tends to clog effluent dispersal fields using these systems greatly enhances the longevity of that soil treatment component of the system. And then lastly, you know, most of these systems are being used on parcels where water is being withdrawn from a well, it's being used in the household, it's being discharged through a septic system, and the quality of water that's returned to the aquifer as a result of being pre-treated by these systems enhances the water quality in the area. Next slide. We also track the systems in terms of, uh, you know, the, the brand of technology in that top row, uh, Amphidrome, BioClear, and the like. We track them by county and we track them by municipality. And you can see on that chart through uh, 2022, we've had 458 systems installed to date. And next slide. And so these are the various proprietary technologies that have been incorporated into the pilot program. Uh, on the right there, you see permanent approval was granted to Amphidrome, BioClear, and Semitech. Those were all approved for use on one acre lots based upon their performance data. The FAST system, a little less effective, is approved for use on 1.4 acre lots. And then we've got those other systems right now that are currently in the testing phase. Uh, you know, one thing that I'd like to say is that in addition to us being able to evaluate these systems for residential use, we've also had these manufacturers submit what I call regulatory quality data to us to demonstrate that some of these have been, have been used to treat non-residential uses. Uh, so we've got the Amphidrome system, the Hoop system, and the uh, BioClear system that have shown to us that they've been used to treat non-residential development throughout the country. And on the basis of that demonstrated performance, we've now authorized uh, those technologies to serve non-residential development as well. And this is my last slide that talks about next steps. So 
the next full implementation report that's due to the commission uh, will be due in November of 2025. And in that report, staff is likely to re recommend that the pilot program be extended beyond 2025 through at least 2027. And one of the reasons for that is that in order for us to approve these technologies, we need to amass a certain uh, amount of data so that we can demonstrate convincingly that they work or they don't work. Uh, so it could be the case that we need more data for systems that are in the ground, um, and that would support the need for extending the program. Uh, we hope to continue to graduate successful technologies based upon their demonstrated performance. Um, and as the program has demonstrated, there has been the need to remove unsuccessful technologies because of either inadequate nitrogen attenuation, or we've removed some technologies for uh, failure to participate according to the rules or uh, by installing systems in the finance that we could um, monitor. So that is my last slide, and I'd be happy to take any questions that anybody might have. I should say that's not just the last slide, that's the last septic pilot program presentation. Indeed. <laughs> but we'll be calling him in 2025. <laughs> Tell us how we're going. Uh, any commissioners have any questions or comments uh, for Ed? Madam Chair, I'd like to offer a comment. Yeah, go ahead, Mark. I think that this pilot program that, that we've had this many years, more than 20 years now, uh, has been exemplary, has been a model for the country. Other states have looked to it uh, to learn, to follow. And in large part, it's been the great work of Edwin Grouski. And I mean, I've teased him off and on over the years, you know, kind of a funny subject. And he was always talking to us about, you know, who in the, in the ground. And yet it's an extremely important one regarding water quality in the pine lands. And I, for one, am extremely grateful to Ed for the great work that he's done. Uh, I'm very glad that he chose to spend his career uh, with us here in the Pinelands. Uh, we've really benefited by it. And uh, I don't know how we're going to do without him. Uh, I'm really going to miss him. And uh, I, I want to publicly thank him. It, it's just been extraordinary, uh, the work that he's produced and the progress that we have made uh, thanks to him. So, Ed Wangrowski, thank you very, very much. You're going to be missed. Thank you. Here, here. Yes. Madam Commissioner, if I if I may add, uh, yeah, go ahead. Not so eloquently, but I, uh, Edwin Grouski has been a a, a a stalwart protector of the pilots for twenty years. The, the The pilot program is indicative of what he's done, but imagine all the other issues that he has worked on. When he comes to us, his presentations are clear uh, and and uh, and and protective of the pilots. Uh, he's been a, an enormous asset. And I don't think we're going to let you go. So I agree, we're going to call you uh, to follow up. But but I want to take this opportunity to thank you so much for all your dedication and your work. And uh, um, going to miss you, and hope we'll stay in touch in some fashion. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Anybody else? Madam Chair, I just like to echo my colleagues. I've, I've known Ed since before he came to the Finance Commission. Um, as a former employee of the Ocean County Board of Health, and uh, he did good work there and he's done great work here. Uh, getting this program started was not easy uh, 20 some odd years ago. And it, it has been, it was a relief valve that helped the commission in certain cases that was very important. And, uh, and it also helped benefited uh, residents that wanted to develop on constrained sites without doing environmental harm. So it's been a great program, as, as Mark said, largely by Ed, and uh, we'll bring him back and add to the 2025 <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I know where it lives. <laughs> well, thank you, Alan. But, you know, I do have to say, when I joined the commission in 2002, 
much of the work was done. I came here and the rules of the CNP were already written. So it was just a matter of me uh, implementing the rules that the commissioners that ad hoc committee wrote. So don't give me the credit. It was really the commission program. Thank you so much, Ed. Anybody else? All right. Thank you. And we don't need to do, that was just an update, right? We don't need to do any formal. Okay. Um, next up, Gina and Marcy uh, will be going over uh, the Kirkwood Cohancy water management um, amendment revisions. While Paul's loading that presentation, I'm just going to say at the outset that you know, we did discuss this in November. Um, the governor's office um, has the uh, draft to, to review it and approve with work commission action. Um, and at the last commission meeting, Jerry, Commissioner Eirich asked um, if we could talk about the revisions that we're proposing. Um, and we, we, we do that this morning, and unfortunately, he's not able to hear it. <laughs> But he'll be he'll be watching the uh, the tape or the live stream of the meeting later to make sure he you know is aware of the conversations this morning. So that's really why we're talking about this again this morning, just to make sure that um, you all are up to date on um, the discussions and conversations that commission staff had after we last met with you, and um, make sure we've answered all your questions. Well, I, I think Sue covered. Um, the, Sorry, did I do slide number the, one? You did. You did slide number uh, two, but that's all right. So I'm just going to recap. Um, Gina, can you turn your mic? Oh yeah. Sorry. I was just going to yell but if this helps. Um, so just to recap, uh, so that everybody's on the same page. Uh, in November, as Sue said, we had discussed with the PNI uh, the rule proposal and the comments that we heard, and we uh, made suggestions for additional changes to the rule that would require reproposal of the of the of the revisions. And this really is what Sue had described. Um, the comments that we heard from the committee are shown here on the slide. So I'm not gonna repeat those. Um, and to follow up on the comments of the committee, we went back and discussed those issues with staff at the Water Allocation uh, Office of VEP and heard from them that they were surprised that they were including word quality on their water allocation permits and that they intended to remove that word from the oh. um, from the water allocation permits. Uh, we discussed with them how they evaluate 90% uh, return of withdrawn water. Um, and based on that discussion, we added some more language to the rule proposal um, that I think we've already distributed and you've seen and the governor's office has it. Uh, it includes adding a hydrogeologic report requirement to the resource extraction standards that will require them to fully describe how they're withdrawing the water, where they're withdrawing the water and how they're returning it and how they're calculating that 90% of the water will be returned. We stuck with 90% um, uh, as the standard for return to meet the definition of non-consumptive use. Uh, because that is what DEP uses, and we want to align with that. Uh, we also met with the aggregate industry at their request. Um, they wanted to reiterate that they're a very heavily regulated uh, industry. The question about return water quality, they felt, is addressed by a wide array of permits that they have to get both from DEP and their uh, discharge elimination, pollution discharge elimination system permit, which deals specifically with the return water um, and, and various other permits, including soil district review um, for sedimentation. Um, so they felt they just needed us to know that um, it didn't affect 
any changes that we made to the rule proposal. We really base that on committee comments and discussions with DEP. Uh, so this just reiterates what we've mentioned. 90% return is what remains in the definition for non-consumptive use. We remove the word quality from um, the definition um, because that is dealt with elsewhere in the CMP. Water quality standards are contained in other places in the CMP. Since this rule deals only with water allocation, sorry, not water allocation, water management, um, diversion and its impacts, the volume impacts to um, the resources of the Pinelands, we removed water quality from this section, proposed section. Uh, as I mentioned, we're requiring a hydrogeologic report from resource extraction applications with the proposal. So these are the next steps. Um, the revised proposal is with the governor's office for review. We hope to bring the reproposal re notice to the full commission in February. Uh, that would allow us to publish to the New Jersey Register in April 3rd. Um, and I just have the schedule laid out here. I don't want to repeat every step, but this would lead us to adoption, yay, barely in November. Um, so that's that's our timeline. And uh, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to discuss them with you. Madam Chair, I have a question if I may. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, I didn't realize that they get national pollutant discharge elimination system permits from DEP. Is that correct? That is correct. That's for the return flows? That's my understanding. So and then, that's why in some ways this is a management program, not an allocation program, right? For, for us, it's a water management program dealing with volume impacts to the resources of the Pinelands whether it is stream flow or adverse impacts to habitat. And under the NIPTES program, DEP is reviewing what water I'll broadly quality. call water quality? Yes. They also do, and then they do water allocation separately. So they get a water allocation permit from DEP and then an EGIPTES permit from DEP. Thank you, that helps a lot along with an application to the commission and a certificate of filing and a full review of all of our standards as well. I mean, that, that was an interesting point that uh, when we had our most recent discussion with the representatives the industry made, you know, there are long lists of permits and approvals that they have to get in addition to the commission's review, it was a good reminder for us, I think, of, um, you know, all the work they're already required to do and, and the controls that already exist on water quality. In the commission, obviously, we have our own standards for water quality that aren't changing. Um, they still have to apply. They still have to meet all of our standards. This is just an additional, if you will, um, review of water quantity that we would now have specific standards for. And the information you know, that they're required to submit, the report that Gina mentioned, um, we thought it best not to impose a requirement that they write a new and different report for us. So this is basically the same information they already have to prepare and submit to DEP to get their permits from DEP. It's the same information, the standard for non-consumptive use would be the same. Um, we thought that was important to not, um, not require slightly different reporting or standard. In, in this instance, we thought it was appropriate to, to have our standards match. Great. Uh, anybody else? Questions, comments? Okay. Um, so I think we need a vote, right, Sue? Uh, no, not really. No? Um, um, this was really just to make sure that we had reviewed all of this one last time with you all. As we said, we, we have submitted the proposal to the governor's office for review and approval. Um, they typically prefer that no no votes be taken until they have 
finish their review. Got it. So um, we will um, be checking in with them to see where, where they are in the review process and hope to have this resolution for you in two weeks. Okay. Great. Thank you. Um, okay. Um, moving on, we have a public comment. So, Paul, if you could put the number on the screen. Um, is there anyone in the room? Sorry, I had an issue there. Um, no, all good. Yeah. All right. Okay, let's try this again. Okay. Um, all right, there we go. Just to remind everyone, um, three minute uh, limit on public comments. Uh, if you are watching at home, please dial in um, and hold until um, we admit you to the meeting. Is there anyone in the room? I don't think we have a, no written list, right? Okay. Michelle Foreman is at the mic, so. Okay, go ahead. How many pages is this water management review? How many pages is it? About are you asking how long is the hydrogeologic report? Or, or are you asking what we're going over right now? The Herford Cohancy Water the Management CMP. The rule proposal? Yeah. It's about 30 pages. 30 pages. 30, it's 30 it's pages? On the website. About 30. It's on our website, so you can see that there, but it is somewhere between 20 and 30 pages. Yeah. All right. And how many how many pages is the amendment? The amendment itself? Ooh. 11? Uh, yeah. I'm going to guess well, around. I, 11 that. pages? I think so. Of amendments so, on the 30 page? Right. So the, what's included in a proposal uh, is comments. So we include all the comments that the public has made and respond to those. So that's included in that whole proposal package that's 30 pages ish around 30. Pages. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, Heidi, you're the only other public member here. Do you have any questions? Hi, um, Heidi Yeh, Policy Director for the Pinelands Preservation Alliance. A question I had about the definition of non consumptive use is if. Um, whether the time frame is defined, because if water is withdrawn and then held indefinitely, even though it may have the intention of being returned, that is effectively a removal. So is there a specific time frame? So that would go into the methodology description. They would have to describe if they intended to hold it for some reason, but really it comes down to an understanding of the way the water is withdrawn. So it gets sucked up in a tube along with the sand. And when the sand is deposited on the barge or on their stockpile, the water runs back immediately into the, into the water. So I don't really think that timing is an issue. It's not like they're pumping directly into a cistern or something. This is this is processed water. Okay, so effectively same day return? Yes, okay. like immediate. <laughs> I think that's all for Laura. That's all for people in the room. In the room. Uh, mm -hmm. Is there anybody on the phone? There is. Okay. Good morning, caller. You are live in our meeting. Can you please state your name for the record? Yes. Good morning. Um, Kevin Coakley, um, an attorney with Connell Foley in uh, Roseland, New Jersey. And I represent. Uh, the Clayton companies. Okay. Go ahead and give your comment. Um, the uh, uh, proposed amendment, uh, which is uh, has been sent to the governor's office, and apparently the committee has has seen it. Um, is that available to uh, the general public or for the regulated public at this point? Yes, it's it's been posted on our website for. A month or more. It's there right on the website. If we can email you after the meeting to give you the specific link, but but it is there in a couple of places. Okay. Thank thank you very much. 
Thank you. Any other callers? I don't see any other callers. All right, then let's close the public comment period, if we could. Um, any commissioners have any questions or comments before we move to adjourn? All right, hearing none, thank you, everybody. Uh, can I get a motion and a I second? Move we adjourn, Madam Chair. And a second? Aye. Thank you. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed abstentions? All right. Thank you very much, everybody. Have a great weekend.